I am doomed. My entire family is diabetic or pre-diabetic, and I'm destined to get it as well. After all, genetics are a huge major factor that a lot of people don't want to talk about. We like to believe that we can control our health based completely on the decisions that we make, but of course, genetics are a huge component. I've gotten these sentiments from viewers before who feel that they're destined to get diabetes themselves given their entire family has it. Now, I didn't realize that my entire family had it too until recently. And I get it. It's discouraging since, yes, my genetics are, without a doubt, suboptimal for metabolic health compared to the average American, which we'll get to later in this video. But if you do have the cards stacked against you, what can you actually do about it? First, we have to start with what the terms mean, diabetic and pre-diabetic. We're talking about type 2 diabetes here, not type 1, completely different disease processes. And type 2 diabetes is a form of metabolic dysfunction whereby you have insulin resistance. Insulin is the hormone that helps glucose enter your cells. And there are a few diagnostic cutoffs for type 2 diabetes, one of them being a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5% or higher. Now this measures how much glucose is stuck on the hemoglobin in your red blood cells, and therefore roughly estimates your average blood sugar over the last three-ish months. So 6.5% and higher is diabetic. If you're 6.4 down to 5.7, you're in the pre-diabetic range, and below that is normal. Now, my mother has been in this pre-diabetic range for several years, and the unfortunate thing is, she sees her doctor very regularly, but the prescribed treatment is some vague lifestyle intervention. Hey, you should exercise and eat more. And we'll do annual monitoring to see if you develop full-blown type 2 diabetes. And it's almost as if they don't see this as a concern. Like, ah, it's like, it's, it's a warning sign, but pre-diabetes, eh, no big deal. That's the key issue here, which is that people with pre-diabetes think that they don't have metabolic dysfunction. Since, hey, they're pre-diabetic and not fully diabetic, so everything must be fine. This is what my mom believed for the longest time, despite my pleas to the contrary. Very easy for parents to just dismiss what their children are telling them because, hey, I raised you kind of thing. And this leads to a very casual approach to metabolic health. But the truth is that you don't distinctly develop a metabolic dysfunction only when you have a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 or higher. It's actually a spectrum and you've been experiencing metabolic dysfunction well before meeting that cutoff. So again, it's not binary whether you either have it or you don't. But unfortunately, with our current Medicine 2.0 approach to healthcare, that's when we decide whether or not to intervene. Now, I do discuss this in far more detail in the book summary of Outlive, that's Peter Tia's book right up here, and also link in the description, including why an A1C is not the optimal measurement of your metabolic function, but why it's a decently good proxy. Now, let's talk about the genetic factor. Most people fall into one of two camps. Either they perceive that genetics are everything, and if they're overweight, or they're unhealthy, or they have any negative health trait, they blame it entirely on their genetics as if it's preordained. Nothing they could do about it. Bad health was their destiny. They don't consider their sedentary lifestyle and terrible diet to be any factor that contributes to their health. But the other side falls in the opposite extreme that says, no, genetics, they don't matter at all. Any health concern is you not working hard enough. For some fitness influencers, they may believe that they're in amazing shape and have great health, all because of their own choices and their own hard work ignoring any contributing genetics. Both sides, of course, are wrong. For example, Chris Bumstead, who won the Mr. Olympia Classic Physique six consecutive times, one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time, he will admit that he has incredible genetics to start. But he also puts in a ton of work. As always, the truth is somewhere in the middle. The most important factor, other than time spent in the gym, about how jacked and lean you're gonna get is genetics. And so you you have to understand that your goals have to be referenced to what your genetic likelihood of achieving them are. So it's really, really important to contextualize multiple qualities. One is how much recovery and rest and relaxation time do you get compared to work and being underslept? Another is genetics and the other is age. They are the biggest factors for results. And people seem to think that you can just kind of like hack your way to the best plan. And if you just do the right things, you'll get amazing results. Realism can be a painful pill to swallow. Now bear with me, because this is coming back to metabolic health. Unlike Bumstead, there are many influencers who aren't so forthcoming with their genetic component. We're led to believe that all they accomplished, their looks, their great physique, is solely based on their hard work. But if you followed their exact same routine, their diet, exercise regimen, stress reduction, sleep, recovery, all the components as them, that doesn't mean you're gonna look like them or see anywhere close to the same level of results. Of course, 
following healthy protocols will help you see improved results relative to your baseline. But you have to remember that it's a combination of both genetics and hard work coming into play. The scientific community acknowledges this when it comes to health. The BMI for South and East Asians, I'm South Asian myself, has actually been shifted compared to the general population. Now, BMI is a way to stratify risk based on your body's weight and height. It's not a perfect measurement, it's meters in height squared over kilograms in body weight. For the general population, normal is 18.5 to 24.9, overweight is 25 to 29.9, 30 to 34.9 is class 1 obesity, also known as moderate obesity, and so on for the three classes of obesity. Now, BMI is not a perfect measurement, it's just a way to stratify approximate risk. Of course, you're going to have outliers. Again, Chris Bumstead, he would be considered obese by these standards because BMI is just weight and height without any attention paid to muscle mass versus fat mass. But generally speaking, these benchmarks are applicable to most people since most people are not jacked and shredded. 99% of the population is not over-muscled. And for most of us, having a higher weight and a higher BMI is usually due to subcutaneous and visceral fat. Now, subcutaneous underneath the skin is the fat that you see and that you might be self-conscious of. But it's the visceral fat, the fat that's around your internal organs, that is actually the most damaging to our health. That is what causes inflammation, metabolic dysfunction, and the many downstream effects of that. This is how the BMI is stratified to categorize the risk associated with adiposity, how much fat someone has at these different BMI. With South and East Asians, the scale is shifted though. So a BMI of 23 or higher is considered overweight, and a BMI of 27.5 or higher is classified as class 1 obesity. Remember, for the general population, that's 25 and 30. So why is it shifted? Because South and East Asians have a higher visceral body fat at a given BMI. And this means at that given BMI, their risk is higher. So to account for this, the whole BMI scale has to be shifted for them. So a Caucasian with a BMI of 24 is considered normal, whereas a South or East Asian with the same BMI, the same weight, the same height, is considered overweight from, again, a health risk perspective. So clearly, genetics are a huge factor. This is just one simple example to get the point across, but this applies to far more components of health and fitness. So if you're like me, it's easy to get down on your genetics. You think, nah, oh, what the hell, it's so unfair. My whole family is either pre-diabetic or full-on diabetic, so I'm destined to get it too, right? Not necessarily. It's interesting how we generally focus exclusively on the negative parts of our genetics or our background but not the things we're grateful for. So we complain about our metabolic health predispositions while simultaneously taking our height for granted, for example, which is also highly genetic. Genetics are not a reason to give up and believe that your outcome is inevitable. It should be the fire that ignites you to take a stronger action earlier on in life. Think of it this way. You're stuck with those genetics, whether you complain about them or not. Complaining is not actually helping. What good is it doing for you? So what am I doing about it and what action steps can you take as well? First, we need to take agency and ownership of these problems. It might not be our fault, but it is our responsibility. There are three things I want to share with you. The first principle is to understand that you can't manage what you don't measure. You want to measure a few different things. Your weight, your body composition, and insults to your metabolic health. That's a good start. First, with weight, a simple bathroom scale is going to do the trick. You want to weigh yourself in the morning after you use the restroom and before you eat or drink anything. It's going to give you the most consistent readings, but keep in mind there's still some fluctuation. So you want to record this. Don't just remember what it was yesterday or the day before. Record it down because you're going to see trends. You want to see those trends over weeks and months to see if what you're doing is actually working. Next is body composition. How much muscle versus fat do you have in your body? This is where the DEXA scan comes in, which uses very low dose radiation to more accurately determine your body fat versus muscle mass. It's very, very low in radiation, and therefore the radiation risk is negligible for most people, and it's considered the gold standard in body composition measurement short of doing an autopsy. I actually got mine done recently at the end of December for $75. A good DEXA scan is gonna provide you with total body fat, your visceral body fat, and a few other metrics like appendicular lean mass index or ALMI, and fat-free mass index, or FFMI. And we cover that in more detail in the Outlive book summary linked below. I do one to two DEXA scans per year. And it was actually my most recent DEXA scan results in December, which were pretty bad. And they gave me the motivation to kick things into high gear because what I thought was working previously wasn't working as well. I was heading in the wrong direction. So more on that in a little bit. Now, the issue with a DEXA scan is that you're not gonna do it every single day or every single week. 
So what I do and what I recommend is that you find a bioimpedance smart scale at home. I use the Withings Body Scan Scale, and I've used some variation of a Withings smart scale over the last several years since 2019. The reason is that number one, it automatically syncs to my phone. I don't wanna get on the scale, look at a number and then write it in every morning. I wanted to stand on it and then boom, done. It's already synced to my phone. Number two, it has bioimpedance. Now bioimpedance is not as accurate as DEXA. However, it is very precise. Bioimpedance is the mechanism by which the scale sends these very tiny electrical impulses through your body. You don't feel it. And based on the resistance, it calculates your muscle mass versus your body fat. And the body scan has the handle, so it's actually doing the bioimpedance from your feet and through your hands. It's supposed to give you a more accurate result. Tell you a bit about your limb mass and your limb fat and also your visceral fat. So it's a nice tool to have, but I don't over rely on the exact numbers. I rely more on the trend because it is accurate and not precise. Accurate means close to the true value. Precise means a close clustering of values. It is very precise in that it clusters those values tightly so that if I see my body fat going up or going down on the body scan scale, I know that that is the actual trend in which my body fat is going. But if the scale says, hey, Kevin, you're only 18% body fat, but my DEXA says 25, I'm actually 25. The scale is just making me feel better. But if the scale goes from 18 to 17, then my DEXA will go from 25 to 24. I've tried a few smart scales over the years. Withings is my favorite. I've actually bought several with my own money over the years, either as gifts or for myself. And if you wanna try it yourself, use the link below and you'll get a special discount. And the third category are insults to your metabolic health. This is the main factor you're looking for when it comes to preventing diabetes and preventing this onset of insulin resistance. That's ultimately what type two diabetes is. It's insulin resistance. So every year I measure my fasting insulin level and my fasting blood sugar because these are helpful metrics. It's kind of like the DEXA. I do it once or twice a year, but it's not gonna give me a daily insight. For those who do want to go a step further, this is not gonna be necessary for most people, but an oral glucose tolerance test. That's where you get a more meaningful measurement of your body's response to sugar. So you drink this sugary solution and then they draw your blood every 30 minutes and they're gonna measure and plot your glucose and your insulin over that time to see those kinetics. But just like DEXA is to a smart scale with bioimpedance, these tests are very infrequent. So I use something else to measure my glucose response more frequently day to day as a proxy for insulin secretion. Because remember, anytime you have a large glucose spike, your body needs a large insulin secretion to get that glucose back under control. That brings us to point number two, which is a tight feedback loop. A tight feedback loop is important to all three of these categories. Again, the daily weigh-ins on my smart scale with bioimpedance tell me my weight and body fat every single day. I don't sweat the daily fluctuations, but I can see the trends week to week, which helps shape my behavior. I can see if something is working or not. If let's say I'm gaining weight when I think I should be losing weight, then obviously something needs to change and I don't need to wait six months until my next DEXA scan to see that. Similarly, I bring a tight feedback loop to my metabolic health as well. And for that, I use Levels, who is sponsoring this segment of the video. I actually purchased Levels with my own money back in 2019, and I've been using them ever since. It's my main feedback loop for my diet. Since my body fat has creeped up in the last year, and now I'm at 0.6 pounds of visceral body fat instead of my prior zero pounds, I'm gonna be using Levels to help with my weight management. Their app and technology are bringing personalized nutrition. So you may have heard of the glycemic index. It's a good starting point to figure out which foods are gonna be less insulting to your metabolic health than others, but these are population averages. And as we've already discussed, population averages are wide ranging. Your unique body, genetics, and gut microbiome has individual needs. So with levels, I've been able to better understand which foods are gonna spike my blood sugar and therefore my insulin more aggressively and how different choices with my exercise, with my diet and with my sleep affects my metabolic health in real time. That quick feedback loop, seeing these things in real time is key to behavior change and seeing the results I want long-term. Someone can tell you that, hey, sleep is important, but until you see the actual effects of sleep detrimentally affecting your life in real time, you're not gonna change your behavior. When blood sugar spikes, your insulin spikes, right? And you're depositing more fat, or at least not burning fat, generating a pro-inflammatory state and causing further insults to your metabolic health. A number of people use Levels for weight loss and they have great success. Levels provides a metabolic health centered approach to both nutrition and weight loss. They frame food not just as calories, but as molecular information. Levels has further evolved from back when I started using it in 2019. And now you can use it either with or without a CGM using features like macro tracking, food logging, 
habit tracking, and labs. Their app on their own is a great starting point for people who aren't yet sure about wearing a CGM continuously. Use levels.link slash Kevin Jubal to get two months for free on your Levels membership or gift it to a loved one like I did for my mom. Click on the link in the description below. Now on to number three, the most important thing is what you eat and how much of those things you eat. Technically, there's a third category of when you eat, but these first two factors are actually more important. Now recently, I've gotten back into cooking and been focusing on elevating my diet in a sustainable way since, again, I was quite disappointed by my Dexa results. And this wasn't the first time I got into cooking. I've had many binges in the past where I would cook for a few months or at least several weeks and then burn out and just find it very tedious. Either the food wasn't tasty enough or it was taking too long to make the actual fancy nice dish or it just felt tedious. So I wanted to make cooking this time sustainable. And I've been doing this now for over a month. My new plan is cooking for myself most days of the week, most meals, and treating myself only to a few dinners over the course of that week. This allows me to focus on a few things that are far more difficult or near impossible to do when eating out frequently. First, I can have much higher quality ingredients. I can do organic produce, organic meats, and avoid seed oils. And also the nasty chemicals and whatnot that are in Teflon and other nonstick materials. Number two, precise macro partitioning, letting me increase my protein intake, reduce my non-fibrous carbohydrates, and add more fiber. And number three, no upset stomach with my gut condition. For those who don't know, I have Crohn's colitis. It's like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis had a miserable baby. Now, if you guys want me to cover how I approach cooking in more detail in a future video, let me know with a comment below so I can gauge interest. But real quickly, my main takeaways are number one, Amazon Prime for grocery delivery. It's gonna save on time, both for driving to and from the grocery store and the time spent shopping in the store. Number two, air fryer for most things, most meats, most veggies. Number three, using a few go-to seasonings that are reliable that I know I'm always gonna like. Number four, bulk marinating meat and cooking it fresh when you're ready to eat it so that you don't have the issue of like nasty, dry, leftover microwave food. Number five, quick salads with olive oil, balsamic vinegar, Dijon mustard, lemon juice, and salt. And number six, if I'm craving carbs, which will happen from time to time, then I'll substitute with something like Kaizen which has both rice and pasta alternatives, which completely satisfy that craving for me. They also don't spike me, as verified by my Levels app. And if you wanna try Kaizen, check out the link in the description for a special discount. Now, I've been doing this since early December, and I've already gone down from 183 pounds to 174 pounds while maintaining the same exercise regimen from last year. And most importantly, without feeling like I'm hungry. I eat to my heart's content, I don't feel miserable, and that makes it sustainable. That is absolutely key if you want this to be sustainable. All right, so key takeaways. A lot of these changes I've brought about, they're feeling frictionless, they're feeling sustainable, and I hope that you can find a system that works similarly for you. The first thing is that you likely have a motivating factor. For me, it was being a thick boy on my DEXA scan. But that motivation, it's not gonna last. So while you're motivated for the next several days or a couple weeks, Build those systems, build those processes so that in the future, when you don't have the motivation, because that motivation will not last, trust me, then it's still gonna make those desired outcomes far easier and just the natural outcome, actually. You build that system to make it easy and effortless. So I reduce the friction of cooking by getting my groceries delivered. I also further reduce the friction of cooking by lowering the bar on the complexity of cooking. Like I don't need to do fancy dishes. I just need a protein and some veggies and also using an air fryer. I'm so structured in other areas of my life it's kind of fun to let loose a bit in the kitchen and not be structured, to not follow recipes. Just throw stuff together, experiment, see what works, what doesn't. Sometimes it's tasty, sometimes not so much. And by the way, the Cuisinart air fryer from Costco is my favorite. Me and my girlfriend have tried like four over the years. Link to that in the description. Next is a quick feedback loop to see how I'm doing day to day with my weight, my body composition, and my metabolic health. And to measure those three things, I use the Withing Scale and the Levels app now I personally do opt to wear the CGM daily, but that's just because I'm a data nerd. You can still get a lot of function without the CGM, just with the app itself. And finally, I'm maintaining my exercise regimen, including both strength training and cycling, which I've been incredibly strict and consistent about over the last three plus years. Remember, resistance training is particularly important during weight loss to prevent that muscle loss, that muscle atrophy. 